Um, you can read this book for face value and then you can read into the book in the spirit. And this book will cause you to travel to some places. So if you just read the book and just said, oh, I read that book, then you need to go back and read it again, because that's why a lot of things that that God has given me to teach you by way of the at three with me broadcast, you may not see written directly sentence by sentence, line by line, chapter by chapter in the book. But as I read the same pages you're reading, these are the revelations that I'm getting from this book. This is the revelation that God is pulling out from these pages. And I wrote this book and I'm seeing revelations in here that, um, it has taken me to the third dimension, if you want to say that. Um, so I believe your first read is, is first dimensional. You know, um, you get the understanding based upon uh, the grade you're in and, and based upon what God is, is, is speaking to you for, for that moment. But I, I definitely believe that, that the book is, 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 is dimensional. And, um, and so that's the way that I'm, I'm going through. Uh, this book. So we're on page eight and I wanted to read something to you from this page. If you have not ordered your book, go to www.wanitabottom.com, get your book. And remember when you order the book, you're going to get a free PDF. So you will get the computerized version of it first for free. No, no charge to you until your actual physical book gets to you. So if you go there and order the book, you will have it. And of course the Topical Bible uh, will be out next week. I'm so excited about this. This would be a special edition, um, the one with my picture on it. It would be signed. And after the special edition series, we're only going to do 500 of those. We will no longer have it with my picture on the front and a series. It would be um, the same color, but not the same book. So this is a special author series that we're getting ready to do. So those of you that are going online and get your special edition series, be the first one to get that one. And it would be signed by me as well. Um, and so all of that is good stuff that's coming up. And of course you saw the fly. I'm going to be in Chicago. So meet me there. I'm doing all of this. So when we get into the lesson, I won't have time to do this. Um, I'm going to be in the city of Chicago in Maywood, Illinois, people that live in Indiana, Milwaukee, those are uh, 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 close proximities of you. I would love to see the bumblebees there. And then I'm going to be doing a book signing at Essential uh, Clothing Store. I love that lady. She's very, very special to me. I love her clothing line and the book signing where I would be signing all the books that people purchase would be that Saturday at um, 12 noon. And I'll be posting that flyer as well. Want to, um, and this is the Help Women's Conference that's down there below. So it, it's free of charge. You come in, all seats are free. I advise you to get there early um, because we're looking at a, a facility that seats about a thousand people, and that's not going to be a lot of room because uh, Chicago is my hometown. And so I have not been in Chicago since February. So um, get there early if you intend to, to, to come. And um, let them know you're a bumblebee. Maybe they'll get you some special seats. I'll, I'll tell them. All right. But anyway, the book says in page nine, since Jesus is the way to the father, then the gate is symbolic of the way. So all anywhere where you will see gate and doors, it is um, it is similar. It is saying the same thing. Uh, the door is a gate. The gate is a door. So. Um, that's going to be very, very pertinent that you remember that uh, the gate is a door and the door is a gate. And it says that is symbolic of the way it is the interest into the things of God. If you do not understand what these colors represent, we're talking about the colors of the tabernacle for, for a shorter time. I wanted to say that, make that note right here. You can get off track in your approach to God. If you miss it here, you may never reach the father. Uh, Jesus said in John 10, 7 through 11, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you that I myself am the door for the sheep. All others who came as such before me are thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to and obey them. I am the door. Anyone who enters in through me will be saved, will live. He will come in and he will go out freely. 
and will find pasture. The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd risks and lays down his own life for the sheep. Now, let's back up. I want to go back to something in this, in this that, um, that I want you to pay close attention to. I want you to really pay close attention to this today. He said, I assure you, most solemnly, I tell you that I myself am the door for the sheep. Key word right here. Key word right here, John 10, 7 to 11. Key word right here is that I am the door for the sheep. I'm not the door for the goats. I am the door for the sheep. I am the door for those that have the potential to follow me, to be led by me. I want you to hear this because I'm putting this on the screen because I wanted to really walk us through this because this is, this, is be, this is going to be good today. I am the door and I am the door for the sheep. So if I don't have the ability to be led, then where am I going? There was a diagram that, um, that I had. Let me get this notebook. I laid it over here. Hold on a second. Half a second. I'm right here. Right here, right here, right here. Not going anywhere. And it, I, was, I got up this morning and I prayed. And I prayed for people on the page today, prayed intensely for some of you today. And um, while I was praying, the Lord began to talk to me about not taking lightly this thing that I keep saying about divine obedience. He said, I don't want you to brush over that because that's not a light thing. That's not a light thing. He said, being led, being led of the Lord is, is coming to a new level of dependency. And if you're going to doubt at all, doubt you, but don't doubt God. He said, this thing about being led, I was looking at something in the scripture and I'm going to draw this diagram for you in a few minutes. And the scripture said in Hebrews uh, 4, 5, 5 and 7, it said in the days of his flesh, in the days when Jesus was walking around in his flesh, offered up definite special petitions for that which he not only wanted, but needed. In other words, he prayed. When Jesus was walking around in his flesh, he offered up petitions of prayer for things not only that he wanted, but things that he needed. Um, I think that's the first thing that we got to get beyond because we think because he was human and divine and that he was the savior of the world, that there was always this thing where... Um, He's just in tune with heaven and just aligned with heaven. But you got to understand that even though his spirit was, his flesh was not. And so his flesh was susceptible to, to anything and everything that we are susceptible to in this hour. And so because he sat in the flesh, he had to also constantly petition heaven for what his flesh needed. Are you hearing that? Because remember when I told you, we are complete in him. He gives us a promise based upon the finished work, based upon the finished work, based upon your spirit. Now, if you're going to get what has been promised to your spirit, you must petition God constantly in your flesh. While you are in this fleshly body, there must be petitions that go up before him. Now watch this. 
when you got to remember this and I, and, 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 and I want God to just help us with this. Why am I being led? Why am I, why am I being called to be led? What is the purpose of me being led? Is God just bothering me? Is he just coming over, tapping on my shoulder saying, I want you to do this. I want you to do that. I want you to do this. Is that, is that what it is people? Cause we're going to, we're going to, we're going to find out. Is that what it is? Is he, is he just, you know, got things promised to us and just everything is everywhere. And we just, you know, are being asked like somebody would, 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 would clarify it as dead, dumb sheep. That's just being asked to trailblaze God, wherever he is, he's trying to take us. Somebody with an immature mindset would, would probably think that way, but I don't think it's that. I believe from prayer this morning that I am being led because of my petitions. Wow. I am being led because of my petition. My petitions put me in the line of leading. When I was in my own will and my own way, I was doing my own thing. The minute you pray and ask God for something, it puts you in the leading line. In other words, it is your prayers that's causing you to be led. Because what he's trying to do is he's trying to get you to what you prayed for. So how is it that we cannot find it in our hearts to obey his leading when the leading is based upon your asking. Let me see if anybody just got what I just said. Mm-hmm. Yes. Wanna, wanna said that's powerful. Yes. That's what, that's, that's exactly what it is. I'm being led because I have petitioned the Lord. I have petitioned the Lord. I am being led because in order to get me to that promise, there's a lot of connective things that has to be put in place. And if I refuse to be led, I will miss the next dot that's supposed to be connected. Watch this. I want you to see something. I want you to see something because somebody said what well, Dr. Bynum, you know, uh, you just, don't know. He said here, he not only wanted but needed and supplication with strong crying and tears to him who was always able to save him out from death. And he was heard because of his reverence toward God. He wasn't heard because of his perfection toward God. He was heard because he reverenced God. And he did that with crying and he did that with tears. So we get in somewhere with, well, you don't understand what I'm going through and why I have to go through this and why, why am I going through what I'm going through and why this and why that? And I'm going to show you why I'm going to show you why, because it's said here that he also reverence to reverence God and his godly fear, his piety, and that he shrank from the horrors of separation. He shrank at the very thought of being separated from God. Now watch this. Now watch this. I want to show you something. He shrank at the very thought of being separated from God. And it says, eighth verse, five and eight. Although he was a son, he learned active, special obedience through what he suffered. In other words, my, my obedience is activated, which means what I am dealing with is a gift from God. It's a gift from God because it activates my obedience. It causes me to move in a direction that, that I'm not familiar with. Because if you knew where your blessing was, you would go to it. 
If you knew what the divine promise was, you wouldn't need God. You would be able to go right to it. But the Bible tells us that there are things that are hidden. There are things that God has kept hidden until now. And it's only being revealed to those that choose to follow him and follow his leading and give up worrying about yourself and the next move. Understanding that I am covered when I obey him. Wow. He got me covered. I'm going to show you something. I, 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 I saw this and I said, well, what are you saying to us? He said, it's time now for the meat of the word to the point that people are, 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 are being able to understand how to incorporate their spiritual walk into their everyday life so that it becomes the norm. It's, it, it's, it's almost like it's, um, it's like breathing in and out. Let me help you with something. You can try to be religious. You have to try to be religious. To be spiritual, you don't have to try to be spiritual. Because spiritual is a part of your very existence. You don't have to try to breathe. That's what spirituality is. You have to try. You have to try to be religious, but you don't have to try to be spiritual. Wow. I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you why. So, so what is this page all about? This page is to assist you in transitioning from trying to be religious and failing at it miserably. To just walking in the spirit. Disappointment about our walk with God comes when we're trying to be religious. Wow, 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 wow. Disappointment comes in our walk with God when we're trying to be religious. Disappointment comes in our relationship with God when we're trying to be religious. Because I'm trying to help somebody who don't feel, who even feel unworthy about praying. All of these are tied to religious means. When you are trying to be religious, watch this, watch this. Then you're trying to do something that Moses them could not accomplish in their day. And I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you this. Watch this. I want you to see something. I want you to see something. It says here, it says here in uh, the ninth verse of the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews. Now, even in the first covenant had its own rules and regulations for divine worship. And it had a sanctuary, but one of this world. A sanctuary, one of this world. A sanctuary, one of this world world okay for a tabernacle tent was erected in the outer division or compartment of which were the lampstand and the table with his loaves of the showbread set forth this portion is called the holy place now watch this but inside beyond the second curtain or veil there stood another tabernacle, another division known as the holies of holies. So watch this. You got the outer court, the inner court, the holy place, and the most holy place, third dimension. It had the golden altar of incense and the ark chest of the covenant covered over with, covered over with rock gold. This ark contained a golden jar which held the manna and the rod of Aaron that sprouted and the two stone tabs slabs of covenant of covenant of the ark of the covenant of the covenant bearing the Ten Commandments. Now watch this. These arrangements have thus been made. The priest entered habitually by habit 
into the outer division of the tabernacle in performance, performance of their ritual acts of worship. Are, are, are you all hearing that? So as long as there is no holies of holies experience, as long as there is no spiritual experience, you can only subject yourself to the rituals of habit, trying to perfect your worship, trying to perfect where you are, trying to, trying to obey and follow a spiritual God with rituals, a, trying to follow a spiritual God with customs and habits. That'll never work. That'll never work. It'll never work because humans get bored. It'll never work because your ADHD would, you, would, would surely kick in. It will never work because you will get tired of that. Just like many of you on this page are tired of going to church, tired of the choir, tired of this, tired of that, because you have lost the true meaning of the experience because it's now become a ritual to you rather than an experience. It's now become habit to you rather than an experience. And you don't feel guilty by not going uh, because you feel some disconnect spiritually. You only feel convicted by not going because people going to ask you where you were. Tap that screen and say, you talking to me, Dr. Bynum. You talking to me, Dr. Bynum. So then I got, I, I got to give an account to people that, that I have relationship with in the church or where I've been for three Sundays or where I've been for five Sundays. Or half the time I'm going and don't even want to be there, sitting up in church and looking at your watch, talking about, I'd be glad when this is over with. Because you've lost, you've lost your fire of spirituality. And now it's religion for you. And that religion says that we're going in the church and we're coming in and we, you know, we're giving God praise and we're going to thank the Lord and then we're going to do the worship team and then the pastor going to preach and then I'm going home and then I'm, I may pick somebody to go out to dinner with. And so now it's a community thing. Rather than a spiritual thing. It's a community thing. Rather than a spiritual thing. And guess what? I'm not an asset to that community. Because anybody that is attending church. That is non-spiritual. You're not an asset to where you go to church at. Tap that screen. Because you know I'm telling the truth. You're not an asset. You're a liability. You're somebody that's a lump on a log. You're somebody that's sitting in the way of productivity. Because in order to be. An asset in an atmosphere, you have to be spiritual. And in order to be spiritual, you have to be willing to be led. To be led. Oh, my God. Who know that I am teaching the truth today? Yes, you got to be able to be led. And he says, watch this. Watch this. Because this outer court, it was habitual. It was the outer division. It was in performance. You know how... The praise team, it ain't even really, you know, I go places and I see people sometimes leading, leading worship. And it ain't even about the worship service no more. It's about your moment. It's about getting your moment to get up there with your outfits on and do what y'all practice. It's not about the intensity of getting people into the presence of the Lord. And come on, everybody, let's lift our hands up because we're going to the presence of the Lord. It's about my performance. It's about, it, it's about how well I sang. It's about how awesome the music was. It's not about a moment because I'm trying to go through the gate. I am in this outer court, but I came to this outer court in the spirit. That's why people said, you know, the outer court enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. We missed the whole thing. Because we say, okay, enter into his gate with thanksgiving. That means I come into church and into his courts with praise. And that means I come into worship and be thankful unto him and bless his name. It's deeper than that. Because if you get into the revelation of what I'm trying to say to you, how can you enter into his gates with thanksgiving when you are entering into him? You are going through him to get to that place. If you think that this is just a church or you think it's just a door or you think it's just a typical gate, then you would do that. But it says enter into his gates, which means enter into the different divisions and compartments of who he is. Let him take you through the first, second and third gateway of his spirit. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with prayer. Thank him as you travel in him. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Are you hearing that? That, that ought to stump us right there. That ought to stump us right there. 
Because, you know, the Bible said also, you know, in the outer court, let everything that have breath praise you the Lord. That means dog, cat. It don't matter how you live. It don't matter. It doesn't matter what you do. We were built and made to give praise to God. So anybody and anything can praise him. But when you start talking about entering to a gate, you're talking about coming into him. You're talking about going through him by way of passageway to get to another dimension. How in the world can we enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise? How can we enter into those gates? How can we come in there and we become still non-spiritual? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Somebody need to help me with that one. And it says here, but into the second division of the tabernacle, none but the high priest goes. And only once a year. And never without taking a sacrifice of blood with him. Which he offers for himself. And for the errors and the sins of ignorance. And thoughtlessness. Which the people have committed. Ninth verse. Seeing that the first outer portion of the tabernacle was a parable. A visible symbol of a type or picture of the present age. The outer tabernacle was a symbol of this present age. How so many people are outside of God, but inside of religion. Wow, 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 wow. We are outside of God, but inside of religion. My God. And it says here, in it, listen to this, please. Listen to this. In it, gifts and sacrifices are offered and yet are incapable of perfecting the conscious or of cleansing and renewing the inner man of the worshiper. Gifts and talents are in operation, but none of that can alter and convert the consciousness of man. None of that can convert and alter the worshiper. None of that can cleanse or renew or purify. So that's why we got churches all over the world, but we don't have change. We don't have change because gifts don't change nobody. My God, my God. Well, I gave $5,000. Sacrifices don't change nobody. That doesn't change anybody. Are you hearing what God is saying? Relationship. I got to get to your conscious mind. I got to get to the heart of what you are dealing out of. I got to get to your spirit. If I'm going to be able to change you, if you're going to be able to benefit from the life that I said you could have, then I got to get a hook in you where I can lead you. I can pull you to me because the scripture just told us that, 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 that when, when, when Jesus is the door, you know how to be brought into him. But look at what he said. Look at what he said. He said, you go in and out freely, freely. He said, because I come to give you an abundant life. I don't come to make you be stuck in a religious form of me and not give you the freedom to be able to go out from me. I don't know about y'all, but I saw the revelation this morning. I saw the revelation this morning in my devotion. I saw it. I don't know if anybody is really seeing what I'm trying to say. And maybe sometime when God give you things, it's not, you know, you just, it, it, it just, maybe you can't explain it. But, but he said, I don't, I don't want my people to just be stuck in me. I want my people to come into me and get the divine information and be able to go out from me and be able to take what I have shown them, take what I'm giving them and take it into the world, take it into their personal lives. Freely, freely, I want them to have movement in the spirit. I don't want them to be stuck to the altar. I want to show you something that I read today. I just said something right there, and I'm going to show you proof. I'm going to show you proof of what he said. He said in the sixth verse, this is what he took me today. 
This is where he took me today. He took me to the sixth chapter and watch this. It said, therefore, let us go on and get past the elementary stage in the teachings and doctrines of Christ the Messiah. Is anybody listening? Is anybody listening? Let us go on and move on from this out of court experience. Let us go on and move on from the experience. Watch this from the experience of constantly coming to the altar of the experience of constantly having to do our first work all over again of the experience of constantly having to deal with the elementary parts of this Christian experience. When are we going to get beyond that? And that's why on this page, you don't hear me talk a lot about put that down and don't do that and don't do this and don't because I'm so over that. And if you're coming on this page to be taught, it's time for you to mature and get past that. We shouldn't be still talking about dirty diapers. We still shouldn't be talking about oops, bleeps and blunders. Because there, there does come a time in your life where you just look at it and say it's just dumb to do that. I don't know about y'all, but it's just dumb. Because the time and the energy that it takes you to get back in right relationship with God, it ain't even worth it. I mean, you mess up and then all of a sudden you just, okay, you guilty. You just feel so guilty. You feel so guilty and you wear that guilt for days. And then you say, Lord, forgive me for days. And then you got to get past it for days. And it takes you so long and so much energy to forgive yourself and get beyond it until when you are tempted by it, you be like, it ain't even worth the trouble. I can't because I know that's going to be a journey up the road and around the corner for me to get back in right relationship with God. And even though the scripture said he has instantly forgiven me, the hard part is not being forgiven by God. The hard part is forgiving myself. That's what takes up my time. That's what, that's what prolongs my issue. That's what causes me to feel like I'm not worthy to come into the presence of God to pray or to ask God for anything. That's what makes you feel like a dirty dog. For too long. Because that one pleasure, you didn't count up the cost. Am I talking to anybody? Because that's how it feels to me. That's how it feels to me. I'm out here in California by myself. You don't think men be looking at me? Yeah. But I'm like, boo, you ain't worth it. I'm sorry. Mm -mm. I'm going to eat alone in this restaurant every night by myself. Don't, mm -mm. don't need no boyfriend. Don't need... Nobody to come to my room because that's too much energy right there. That that's way too much. Don't need nobody to babysit me. Don't need nobody looking over my shoulder. That's too much energy that I would have to put out to get back in right relationship, to feel like I'm worthy to still preach to people, to feel like God done forgave me, forgive for feeling like, you know, maybe I, I done lost all my blessings because of what I just did. That's too much drama. Some of it is not even conviction. Some of it is just you maturing enough to say that's too much drama. Okay. Who am I talking to right there? Who am I talking to? Too much. Too much. And that's wasted time. That's wasted time. That's delayed blessings and delayed miracles. Oh, wait a minute. I got to let me let me let me let me do this this this, this, this diagram for you because I, I, need you to, I need you to understand this. He said here, when are we going to get beyond that? The elementary stage in teachings and doctrines of Christ the Messiah. Advancing steadily toward the completeness and perfection that belong to spiritual maturity. Now I know why we can't get it. Now I know why we don't have spiritual maturity. We don't have spiritual, we don't have perfection, and we don't have a steadfastness in moving toward perfection. Now I know why we're not advanced. We're not advanced because it comes with spiritual maturity, not religious maturity. Not how many scriptures you know, but how many can you make work that you know. Who am I talking to? It says here toward the completeness, the finishing of it, 
and perfection that belong to spiritual maturity. Let us not again be laying foundations of repentance and abandonment of dead works, dead formalism, and of the faith by which you turn to God. Oh, let us not go back to your beginning, please. Please, let, let, let's stop starting over. Oh, my God. That's why we can't get there. Can we just not start over no more? Can we just stop starting over? Oh, okay. Anybody want to hear this? Anybody want to hear this? Because I can go and quit early. Can we just not start over? Can we just stop doing that? Because we're not going to move toward advancement and we're not going to move toward uh, advancing to a level of perfection where our walk with God is being perfected. The rhythm that we have in God is being perfected. We're not going to get there if we keep starting over. I'm talking to some bumblebees today for real. For real. For real. Because I, 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 I think about this Often, I go to my dance school out here, and guess what? They don't have any signs up throughout the building that says no loud talking, no loud cell phones, no smoking, no drinking, no lounging. There's no signs up in this school, period. About stuff like that. Everywhere I looked on the walls and hanging up in the brochures, it's about a class that you can take, about a workshop that's coming, about the teacher that's coming back or another teacher that's flying in from another country that's going to be doing workshops and uh, the class schedules and and um, concerts and and shows that are coming up. They, 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 they don't have signs all up and down the wall saying no loud talking, no chewing gum, no smoking, no drinking, no lounging. Do you know why? Because they're not attracting fools. They're not attracting people that don't know how to bring themselves to maturity. They are attracting people that know how to walk into a space and discern where you are. And conduct yourself accordingly. I'm, I'm saying something right there. We Christians, we got too many doggone signs. Don't do this. Don't put that down. Oh, don't wear that. Don't wear this. Don't put that color lipstick on. Don't wear that. Don't color your hair like this. Don't wear pants. Don't wear skirts. Don't wear too tight. Don't wear. We just stay with signs on our life. But there's not enough billboards up to tell us what we can accomplish and what is available to us. I'm preaching today if don't nobody want to hear it. It don't nobody want to hear it. They don't have no signs up that says no smoking. Don't nobody pull out a cigarette. I haven't seen not one person pull out a cigarette. I've gone outside and saw people standing outside smoking. But I ain't seen nobody lighting no cigarette up in that building. I ain't seen nobody lollygagging and talking all loud and scramming all in the hallways and acting crazy. I don't see no signs up that says no cell phones, whatever, whatever, whatever. No. It's an atmosphere of maturity. It's an atmosphere that they automatically know we came for the art. We didn't come to be disciplined about cell phones and smoking and drinking. And what am I trying to say to you? There are people that smoke. There are people that drink. There are people that curse. I want you to hear what I'm saying. But when you walk into a building that don't allow it, you just don't do it. And when you are there for two hours taking a class, I don't care how bad they want to smoke a cigarette. Don't nobody walk out of that class talking about I'm going to get a cigarette before the class is over with. I had an experience the other day and I didn't feel well. And so I pressed my way anyway and I went to the class. And when I got in Miss Kathy's class, I was in the class and I started feeling a little whatever, whatever. So I just went and kind of sat on the side a little bit. And so... Class was going on for about an hour and a half. It was another 30 minutes to go or so. And I just went over on the side and said, let me sit down because I just felt a little nauseous or something. I just didn't feel well. 
And I said, let me sit down. Maybe it's something I ate. And plus that when you dance and using all the muscles, it causes you to be nauseous. That's normal. And I went and sat down. So when she starts splitting us up in groups and saying group A, group B, group, when the group started walking, I just grabbed my bag and just tipped out. Do you know I got a text from Miss Kathy and said, Miss Bonner, my class ends at three o'clock. She just said, where are you, sweetie? How are you? Oh, I, you know, the, you all right? She said, Miss Bynum, my class ends at three o'clock. And I said to her, I do apologize. I wasn't feeling well. She said, well, get your rest and I will see you next class. Do you know what that said? You don't just walk out my class. You don't walk out my class. My class ends at three o'clock. You don't decide when you want to walk out. Are y'all, is anybody listening to me? Is anybody at all listening? And if we do not get ourselves as Christians beyond the rules, good Lord have mercy, we will never walk in what God has for us. He can't give you a plan for constantly giving you rules. Oh, Lord have mercy, Jesus. I feel like running right now. I feel like running right now. We go into the doctor's office. We don't sit up in there and light up cigarettes. They said no smoking and you sit there for as long as you need to sit there and you don't smoke. But the minute God says don't smoke, the minute God says put that down, we got every reason why we can't. But we'll put it down for the doctor's office. We'll put it down for the lawyer's office. We'll put it down to go into the grocery store. We'll put it down to go into Walmart. I'm preaching right now. We will put it down to go into the mall. We would stop having sex. We would stop smoking all of that to walk through the mall for as many hours as we are there. We will put it down for all of that. I will put it down to go in the dance class. But only when it comes down to my own life and my own desires and things that I know God has for me. I can't put it down for me. And I got a problem with that. I got a problem with that and you should too. Well, you can stop. Immaturity for every organization, every company on the face of this earth. But you don't deem yourself and your destiny important enough for you to put it down for you. There's a problem right there. There's a problem right there. There's a problem right there, people. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. He said, he said right here, and you watch this. He said, he said, what teachings, when are we going to be finished? Thank you, God. With te I don't even think about sinning out here. I don't even think about, well, well, you know, I'm out here by myself, so what can I get into? <laughs> I go to the same restaurant, same two restaurants every night. Um. And when I get through a class, that's my little treat. And I go to the restaurant. And everybody has gotten to know me. Um, I ain't make no big announcement about I'm some famous preacher or nothing like that. I just walk in, have my headband on, have my bag with me because I'd be coming from dance school. And when I walk in, first walked in the door, the people greeted me and whatever, and they sat me. And, you know, everybody was very nice, and it was very nice, and I had a great dinner, great experience. I came back the next day. Everybody was like, oh, hey, weren't you in there yesterday? Yes, I was. Da, 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 da. Third day, the little man by the door now goes, hey. I ain't never went hey to him like that. But you know what? He said she's consistent. When I got in there, the, the other guy said, you want your favorite table? It's right over there. Come with me. I didn't tell nobody. Can I sit? No, you want your favorite? Let's sit you where you like to sit. Are y'all hearing this? The owner is standing in there. I went in there yesterday. It was a group of people at my, at my favorite table. It was all the tables was full except for a couple of booths. They wanted to sit me somewhere. And he said, would you, would you like to sit over here? He said, a man, one of the workers back there, he was eating his lunch at the table. He said, I can make him move. I walk over and I said, you don't have to move. He said, no, no, no. I, get, I said, no, eat your lunch. You can sit here with me and eat your lunch. And he said, you don't mind? I said, no, I don't mind. 
So he sat there and he started eating his lunch and he was eating his lunch and I was just looking at the menu and getting ready. And so then the boss came over and said, you know, I already know what you like. I got them cooking it fresh for you and it's coming out and it's fresh for you. Uh, thank you very much. Do you know why I was getting benefits? Do you know why they were serving me based upon what I wanted? Do you know why I didn't have to make a big deal and didn't have to push about what I wanted? Because I was consistent in coming into that place and showing them that level of respect. And so because of that, he didn't give me no rules about talking loud. He didn't give me no rules about you, you come in here today. You can't come in here cussing. You can't come in here smoking. You can't come in here going off. He didn't have to give me laws and rules. He gave me what my heart's desire was. And we stuck to what I desired. And not how he want me to conduct myself. Am I making a point to anybody today? <sighs> While I was sitting there yesterday at dinner, the girl that waited on me, she, she wasn't my waitress last night. Another gentleman was. And she said she was ringing up some stuff and my booth was near the counter. And she said, so what do you do? And, she, and I said, she said, are you here with the, um, with the art festival? And I said, no. I said, I dance. She said, I knew it was something because you look very artsy. She said, the way you dress and everything, you just, you look like, you know, I said, she's in the arts in some kind of way. I knew it was like either acting or dancing or whatever, whatever, whatever. That lady was able, she didn't, she didn't categorize me as a preacher. She, she didn't say, you must be an evangelist. You must be a prophet. You must, you must really, she, she was able to classify me based upon what was sitting on me and my purpose for being out here. When you get in your purpose, it sits on you. Some of you all think, well, you know what? Well, the doors ain't open yet because being a professional writer ain't sitting on you. Running the streets with booking him at night and acting a fool and I always got to say, well, you know, girl, I just got to call you because, you know, I just messed up last night. But, you know, it was just one of them things. Keep on with all that dumb stuff. Keep on with all because that's what's sitting on you. What's sitting on you is a lust demon. What's sitting on you is a horror spirit. What's sitting on you is a gossiper and a liar. What's sitting or what's not sitting on you is what you're dreaming about, is your profession. And until you get that on you, can't nobody see it on you. And they don't know to hire you. They don't know that you would be an asset to their company. They don't know that you would be an asset to their atmosphere. Because you don't wear where you're going. You're wearing the consistency of the altar. You got Jesus Christ crucified afresh. You hammering him on the cross every day. Every day he's being pierced in his side. He's not the resurrected Christ. He's not the one that's living the abundant life through you. He's the one that's nailed to the cross. Because you won't stop. Because you think you, 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 you waiting for some big power to come and stop you. Don't no power stop you in the doctor's office. Your desire to be seen by the doctor is the power to stop you. No, no power stop you in the mall. Your desire to stay in that mall and shop and have a good time. Knowing that if you light up a cigarette, security going to throw you out of here. That's the power right there. The power that stops us is where we plant our feet. I'm in this hotel and they said no smoking is no smoking. I don't care. They just say I got a little private habit that y'all don't know nothing about, which I don't. I don't care how I feel. I don't care if it's two in the morning. You're going to put your jacket on top of them pajamas and you're going to walk outside this hotel up the street. You ain't going to even stand outside and fund a hotel and smoke. Not where I'm staying. You're not getting ready to do that. Because you know what? So you know what would stop me? Where I want to be would stop me. Where I want to be would stop me. Where do you want to be? Where do you really want to be? I know we talk a good game, and I know you got a bunch of dreamers out there. People that dream all the time. You know what a dream is? A dream is a person that don't never plan to put no work into it. They live high off of what they dream about being. Wow. Wow. Everything that Martin Luther King had a dream about, 
great dream, but somebody had to do the work. In order for little black boys and black girls to walk down the street and be equal, somebody had to do the work. A little black boy and a little black girl had to walk down the street. A dream is not enough. Who gonna work the dream? The harvest is ripe. The labors are few. You wanna be a doctor is out there. You wanna be a lawyer is out there. Somebody texted this to me yesterday and it blessed my soul. Lisa Vaughn texted this to me yesterday and we were talking about our goals. And she said in a text, and she didn't even really, she didn't even pay attention to what she was saying. She was just texting, texting me some stuff. We've been friends since I was 17. She said, Neat, it ain't too late to be great. And I thought I'd drop that nugget to somebody on this page. It ain't too late to be great. The dream is not enough. Somebody got to work the dream. Somebody got to work the dream. This gonna be a, this gonna be a lesson this week. Cause can we get past the teachings of purifying, and the laying on of hands, and the resurrection from the dead, and the eternal judgment and punishment? These are all matters of which you should have been fully aware long, long ago. If indeed God permits, we will now proceed to advance teaching. That's Hebrews chapter 6, the third chapter. If indeed God permits, we will now proceed to advance teaching. It ain't too late to be great. I'm done. I'm done. Where you want to be? Where you want to be? Plant your feet there and your weaknesses will succumb to where you are. Plant your mind there. Plant your spirit there. And where you are will tell where you're trying to come from. No. You looking for a great power to shake the earth? 